And we're live from the live casino and hotel studios in Baltimore. Welcome to Jay Moore's new JBiz Entrepreneur Series, featuring accomplished entrepreneurs from a variety of industries throughout the greater Baltimore region. The JBiz Entrepreneur Series is brought to you by Nemphos Brow, the Mid Atlantic's premier boutique corporate and business law firm, specializing in mergers and acquisitions, startup and entrepreneurial law, intellectual property and technology transactions, and procurement. At Nemphos Brow, the client always comes first, working with companies throughout the entire life life cycle of business. To learn more, go to nemphosbrow.com. Today, we're with Harrell Turkel, CEO of SOS Technology Group, a 15-year-old Baltimore-based technology firm specializing in IT outsourcing and security services. Harrell has been recognized by the Daily Record as successful by 40 and by Smart CEO as a future 50 Baltimore leader. Congratulations on those and welcome in. Thank you, Gary. Nice to be here. Nice to, nice to be with you. And, you know, I think you've seen a couple of these that we've done already. Yes. Uh, we like to find out more about the entrepreneur as opposed to the business, but we will certainly talk about SOS technology. But just give us a little background on you and how you uh, how your journey has gone so far as far as being an entrepreneur. Yeah, so um, I always knew I wanted to get into technology pretty early on. I used to work for a few uh, software companies throughout high school and also a bit of tech support in college. But something in me, I just I realized I wasn't meant to be an employee of someone. Every position I had, I kind of question management, mm. and I always thought I had a better way to do things. And it really came to a pinnacle point when, you know, senior year of college at Towson, I realized that I could be doing IT services my own way, and that there really was a gap and a need in the marketplace here in Baltimore that I thought I could fill. Obviously, being a cocky, arrogant 21-year-old. <laughs> sure. Um, were you? Did you ask a lot of questions when you were a kid? I mean, were you always curious about things? I was. So uh, my father had a technical training company um, that was nationwide, more industrial training. Uh, but that's when I got my my first start with computers. Back then, CompUSA and Computer uh -huh. City were you know prominent fixtures on York Road. And we used to go in there, and I'd scan all the aisles, and I'd check out the newest computers. And I bought my first laptop with my bar mitzvah money at age thirteen. And I recall, you know, crashing the operating system time and time again. And my father's answer was, if you want to get it corrected, you have to figure it out yourself. So it was, you know, crashing, reinstalling, crashing, reinstalling, and just teaching myself technology at an early age. So, so you knew this about you. You knew that you probably couldn't work for somebody and you needed to lead your own company. How did you actually put that into place? So when I was in Towson, I worked for a company doing um, computer training, virus removal. It's called Professor Computer at the time. Uh, and I was one of their you know, star employees traveling across the Baltimore region doing training. And then after I graduated undergrad, I worked for a, a medical software company traveling the country doing software installation for laboratory information systems. And teaching them how to use exactly. it? Exactly. So okay. I'd sit there, install it, spend two days in a hospital in Texas, train the nurses on how to use it, fly back, support it from Baltimore, and then rinse, repeat, start over again. And I enjoyed the travel component the most. Uh, but once again, the managers and upper management, I just seemed to clash with them often. So I knew this wasn't a long-term solution for me. And then how did you actually start your own company? So then I left this software company. Some buddies I had gone, um, had a gap year abroad with freshman year. We decided to do a nine-month backpacking trip in Southeast Asia. Mm. So we packed up. We headed out to Fiji, Australia, Thailand, that whole area. And while I was away, I got a phone call from my employer in Towson, who owned Professor Computer, and she said, I'd like to raise my family. I you know, want to sunset the business more or less. Would you be interested in picking it up yourself? So as I came back to town nine months later, we essentially reached out to most of those clients. Uh, I formed SOS Technology Group with many of those initial clients that I had from the previous company, um, and then we started doing our own IT work. That was more residential um, IT support and training, and we, and we kind of parlayed that into a business IT support and training company. So let me understand that for a second. Yeah. You said when I returned to town nine months later, so you basically took that gap year. You were traveling for that year in Southeast Asia. Yeah. So this call that you received, you received it when you were traveling. You oh. didn't get it when you came back. I was hiking on the Tongarera Crossing in New Zealand. I don't even know where that is, where but they okay. they Lord of the Rings, actually. <laughs> so like it's just, you know, and I remember I had a T-Mobile cell phone with me, an Ericsson, and it rings out of nowhere. An Ericsson. And my five traveling companions are like, how the hell do you have a cell phone signal up here? And out of nowhere, I answer it. It's this old employer of mine. 
And she makes the proposition uh, about buying the book of business, if you will, when I come back to town. So you received that phone call basically three months into your gap year. Yeah. So you could kind of mull it over in your head for nine months. Did you actually mull it over for nine months? or oh, what? I did. How did you think about it? I did. So back then, you'd have to pop into internet cafes if mm-hmm. you wanted to you know, have real email responses. So a few back and forth with her. Also, other opportunities I put applications in for. So I was... Um, when I arrived, I'd have at least some sort of occupation waiting for me. Uh, and, and the more I thought about it, I just could not work for somebody else. So I knew this this was a blessing in disguise. A, it was people I was already comfortable with getting into business with. And B, it gave me the flexibility I needed to really get out there in my own backyard in Baltimore, start a business that made sense, and really take that that experience that I had formulated and just put it to, to you know, Reality, if you will. Basically, it was Bashert. Like Bashert, like, exactly. Yeah. Um, what, looking back on it now, mm-hmm. what didn't you know back then? So I was all self-taught in regards mm-hmm. to technology. So I was lacking that that um, certification by Microsoft or Cisco or VMware. So I actually had a business partner for the first six months of the business when we started in 2004. Uh, and he had certifications front to back. He trained me on many of these things. I passed my Microsoft certification testing with his help. Uh, the difference was I was in both feet into the business, and he still hadn't left his day job at a local company here in town. So about six months into it, we realized he was going to stay where he was, and I was going to run with SOS full-time, and we kind of bought him out of the company and been single ever since. What did you do wrong in the beginning? Many times. Uh, mm-hmm. say Still. So, 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 so many things. And I mean, in truth, when you're starting a business from the ground up, I was only 24 years old at right. the time. Um, I had two or three mentors, which was very important at the time, Jewish Vocational Services, which mm-hmm. is now part of Jewish Community Services. Services right. They put me in touch with a mentor who was an established um, commercial real estate entrepreneur, and he gave me you know, such, such important advice into how to transact, how to do things above board, how to operate correctly in regards to the LLC and tax information. So that was invaluable. Um, but you know, along the way, some hires I made, some, sure. some people I probably shouldn't have worked with, some customers that weren't the right customers. But as, as I actually told someone even yesterday, my CPA, at the beginning, you're so hungry to have new business, you're willing to take on everyone who wants to work with you. I mean, it's only recently that we started being a bit more choosy, choosy yeah, yeah. And, and kind of cutting the dead wood, if you will, each mm-hmm. year. What are the characteristics, if you like examine yourself psychologically, what are the main characteristics of yours that make you the entrepreneur? So I think being a risk taker. Mm -hmm. Um, I think having confidence that you're going to succeed. I think having um, kind of an outgoing personality. You can't be an introvert, I think, and start a business. Uh, in general, like I always say, when I when I started this company, I had to go to my my nearest and dearest, which were my friends' parents and my parents' friends, right? Mm, right. And those were some of the first clients, besides the ones that we you know picked up through that small acquisition. Um, but if you're really focusing on working a desk job, being an entrepreneur is probably not for you. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder that the Jay Moore's New Jay Biz Entrepreneur Series featuring accomplished entrepreneurs is brought to you by Nemphos Brow, the Mid-Atlantic's premier boutique corporate and business law firm. They specialize in mergers and acquisitions, startup and entrepreneurial law, intellectual property and technology transactions, and procurement. The customer always comes first at Nemphos Brow. Learn more at nemphosbrow.com. We're visiting with Harel Turkel, CEO of SOS Technology Group, and we've talked about you and we'll continue to do that, but tell me about SOS. SOS Technology Group. So when we started SOS in 2004, it was really answering the call uh, for the need of an IT company that could work in the small to mid-sized business space, but with enterprise-level solutions and best-in-class customer service. So as I say, even today, 15 years later, if we can't give our customers the best experience front to back, then we shouldn't be in business at all. So it's the hand-holding, it's the the extra phone call, it's the face-to-face visits, it's the quarterly meetings, talking about their technology. I mean, we position ourselves as more of a CIO for them Mm. than just a tech support company. I'm going to ask you this question, and I'm sure if you had 24 hours, you probably couldn't answer it in that, but technology has changed so drastically in the last 10 years. It seems like we've made more advances in the last 10 years than we have in the previous 100 years. Completely. Uh, And... One way that we see it, so we do a lot of infrastructure for clients with their servers, their desktops, laptops, their networks, 
uh, servers when we first got started. I mean, it was a twenty-five to mm. fifty thousand dollar investment, investment. To, to buy yeah. a proper server for your small business. You know, now five to ten thousand dollars, you can put a server in place, and then cloud. I'm going to start with cloud. Clouds changed the entire environment. So now having the conversation about whether you should even have a server in house or put everything into a private or public cloud has changed the entire landscape. So things have progressed quickly. It was funny. I'd say for the first ten years, it was slow, gradual growth. And then about five years ago, it just took off. Is there a reason for that? I think there's just been so many innovations. In particular, there was this turning point. If you look at where hardware has been, like the cost of memory and hard drives and, and back to computers, there was a turning point when you know we used to pay all this money for 50, you know, 8 gigs of RAM or 16 gigs of RAM. And then at one point, it became just smaller scale growth for, for lesser and lesser money. Uh, so now having storage is cheap. And cloud storage is actually where most of the margins are made. How do you actually keep up with all the technological changes? So we're part of a number of different um, business brain trust groups, a few nationwide groups. One of them is called TrustX Alliance. Uh, we meet on a quarterly basis with competitors from across the country. Uh, we have vendors who come in and train us on their newest products. We have uh, you know vendor showcases where you can see the newest in virtualization and cloud technology. So... It's a constant, constant education. And even our technicians, I mean, they're, they're taking new classes on Continuing a weekly education. basis. Yeah. They're getting certified <laughs> monthly as well. So it's, it's really an evolving marketplace. You told me that healthcare is kind of your sweet spot. Yeah. So probably about 12 years ago, we started doing a lot of HIPAA compliance, um, healthcare IT. They have different requirements than most small businesses or mid-market businesses have. Uh, so my, my technicians have all been you know, HIPAA certified. We can help clients have encrypted emails and secure patient data. And that by itself was a struggle even before the ransomware attack started and cybersecurity became a thing. Uh, so it's, even that's evolved over the last 10 years. What do you think about these ransomware attacks? They just seem to be popping up, government, big business, small business. Everybody seems to be susceptible to it. So the joke in the street is that everyone has been hacked at this point. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of knowing whether you have or not. <laughs> so whereas the average ransomware amount might have been you know, five figures last year, now the average amount is less than $1,000. Because these ransomware authors across the globe know that for a small business, if I show you a $900 price tag to get your files back, chances are you're going to pay to release them. So it's changed the way that we operate. It's changed the way that we have to um, educate our clients as well, because you know, most of the issues occur with the person sitting in that seat. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of training and a lot of just due diligence that has to be done. On entrepreneurs are basically responsible. They're in charge of and responsible for everything. Um, how do you strike a work-life balance? It's a great question. So the joke is, with my wife at least, because not only do I have SOS, but I'm also on a number of different boards around town, right. the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore, Sinai Hospital, Baltimore Child Abuse Center. Um, so the, the joke between us is you spend half your week at SOS and half your week on some nonprofit board, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, the truth is, you know, having a, a for-profit business, I feel like it is my, my responsibility to give back where I can. And I give back with my time, my resources, what they call talent, treasure, and um, time mm -hmm. to, to all these organizations around town. But to your point, what do I have the personal time? So we try to get away, you know, at least three, four times a year. I try not to be tethered to my device, uh, if possible. We if just got, possible. Back, we yeah. got back from Israel a few days ago. And what's nice with the time zone, at least, I can be focused on the family until about noon, 1 p.m. And then once East Coast 8 a.m. starts, I'll answer emails for a few right. hours. Six-hour time difference, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. 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 Um, interesting you talk about philanthropy and boards, et cetera. That does seem to be a common thread among most entrepreneurs who basically echoed what you said about the fact that you have a for-profit business, but you feel the need to give back. I mean, the main reason, I think, is that we, we have this responsibility only because at the end of the day, what is our legacy we're leaving for our children, mm -hmm. right? So if our children see that we you know, sell products and we have things and we, and we you know, just do things internally and don't really give back to the community, especially in a city like Baltimore where there are tremendous needs, how do we come across to our children, to our grandchildren in the right. future? So I've always said, I mean, I'll give you a quick example. I went to India about seven years ago on a humanitarian mission through a national nonprofit board that I'm on. And my daughter, I was missing a ceremony at her school. It was her first grade ceremony at that time. And she asked me straight out, she said, why is a little girl in Bombay more important than me? Mm. And I explained to her, if we don't do for them, then no one else will. And she walked over, I'm going to get teary, she walked over to her desk, pulled out her favorite bracelet, and she said, when you find that little girl, give this to her for me. 
I'm going to cry. <laughs> right, so, so a six-year-old seeing right. that, I mean, if I've accomplished something, I think right then there, it, it showed through. I think you've done a good job. Uh, you're getting to that age, and you're not old by any stretch of the imagination, so don't get that impression, but you mentioned your mentors. You had mentors when you were of a certain age. You're getting to that age now where I'm sure people are going to be looking to you for mentorship. How do you feel about that, and how does it come into practice? So I love to share experiences, um, and there are many on this one young adult um, council that I'm part of as well, where I've spoken with individuals. We do monthly lunch meetings as well, lunch and learns, and we share the, 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 the perils and the pitfalls from owning a business. I mean, from choosing the wrong business partner to making the wrong investment to turning down the right acquisition offer or merger offer. So whatever short experience I've, I've gained in 15 years, I love sharing it with everyone and anyone who's willing to listen. Final word from Harel Turkel, just advice or whatever you would like to say to a budding entrepreneur. So I would say keep your head up. Um, there are some days where even 15 years later, I walk into the office and I am you know, thrown many different problems from many different directions. And you think it might be easier to work for someone and to not have to worry about payroll and expenses. But then, you know keep your head above the clouds, you figure it out, and the next day you come into the office again and, and you can't imagine working for anybody else. So the key is just keep your head up, um, ask questions, find a mentor, and learn from experience because really what you can gain on the street, if you will, is much more important than what you can uh, learn in school or through a book, I believe. The CEO of SOS Technology, Harel Turkel, thank you so much. We thank really you so appreciate much, it. It's great. And we have been live from the Live Casino Hotel Studios, the Jay Moore's new JBiz Entrepreneur Series, brought to you by Nemphos Brow, the Mid Atlantic's premier boutique corporate and business law firm specializing in mergers and acquisitions, startup and entrepreneurial law, intellectual property, and technology transactions and procurement. Learn more at nemphosbrow.com. I'm Gary Stein. He's Harel Turkel for Glenn Clark. We'll see you next time on Jay Moore's. J-Biz Entrepreneur Series.